Then it's my pleasure now to introduce our next speaker. Sorab Amari is an assistant books editor at the Wall Street Journal. Prior to joining the journal, Amari served as a non-resident fellow at the Henry Jackson Society, a London-based foreign policy think tank. Amari is co-editor of Arab Spring Dreams, an anthology of essays by young Mideast dissidents. His writing has also appeared in uh, publications as diverse as The New Republic, The Weekly Standard, and Commentary, among other publications. An alumnus for, of Teach for America, Amari holds a law degree from Northeastern University in Boston. Please welcome with me, Mr. Amari. Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining me uh, uh, in the Foreign Policy Research Institute for this very early session. Uh, I certainly had to have my two cups of coffee. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's great being here, as, especially as a former teacher. I'm just so uh, impressed by this program and uh, so thankful for the inv invitation from, from Alan and the rest of the organizers. And I had a chance to speak with uh, three of your colleagues last night uh, after, after Roya's talk, and I was just so impressed by the the depth of knowledge and, and passion that's in this room. So I hope to chat for about 30 minutes about Iranian Islamism. I've never uh, managed to, I mean, I, I don't like to hear the sound of my own voice for, for more than uh, ever really 20 to 30 minutes. So I'm eager to uh, you know, open up uh, a conversation. Um, but I want to put forward two principles and try to uh, see how you approach them as teachers when you want to teach about uh, Islamism or political Islam. And I'll mostly draw on Iran. I'm, I'm an Iranian-American. I was born in Iran. I moved to the U.S. when I was 13. I, uh, you know, I'm just a journalist. I don't claim to have uh, military expertise, and I'm, I'm not a theologian. In fact, even when I was growing up in Iran, I was terrible at the... Uh, the Quranic studies that were mandatory in, in my uh, elementary and middle school. So uh, I'm just an observer of Iranian affairs. I have, I'm fluent in the, in, in the language, uh, although my formal and literary Persian, I confess to you, uh, you know, keeps deteriorating because I don't, you know, I, I don't get to write in Persian as much as I'd like to. So um, and that's a, a warning for anyone who knows, who knows a language and then to tr try to keep it up. So uh, again, so I, I, I just approach you as, as, a, as a writer and as an, as an uh, observer of my, my native land. I happen to write mostly about Iran and the Middle East when I do. Um, but uh, again, I don't, I'm not a theologian. Uh, so two, two ways that I think we think about the Middle East um, and we teach uh, about the Middle East and how our media talks about the Middle East. And the very first one, I think, is this idea that political Islam, as it's preached by Iran's, uh, the Iranian regime's hierarchy, the, the clerical regime, and even beyond that in the, in the rest of the, the Sunni world, that Islamism equals authenticity, and I think this is something that our, our uh, students are, it's an easy way to frame for students, for young people, and in the, in the mainstream media to say, Islamism or radical Islam is an authentic way of life for the Middle East, and therefore, in, in a parenthetical, you know, conversely, you know, modernity or our way of doing things is, is, is somehow inauthentic. Um, and so this, this has been a, a narrative that's actually first and foremost advanced by the Islamists themselves. And in, we've sort of absorbed it and picked it up and now we're projecting it. So, and I, I think it's a problematic one and I think we should, we should try to challenge that. And, you know, and, and you're in a position to do that as, uh, as teachers, if, if you, I think if you have the the right knowledge. So what is Islamism? Islamism, I mean, there are multiple definitions out there. My own one, it's the idea that Islam should be the central organizing principle of people's lives, including their public and political lives, in, 
in uh, uh, the Middle East and in Muslim majority countries and perhaps beyond. And what uh, the, the Islamists themselves, the way they talk about it, is often that we want to restore, quote unquote, the region's Islamic totality. Uh, this, you know, if you go back to the proponents of the Shia Iranian version of Islamism, you'll often hear this phrase that uh, because of the arrival of modernity and because of the fa fact that the West uh, penetrated our societies, and in, 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 in fact it did, both in uh, uh, material and in spiritual terms, that our Islamic totality has been eroded, that its, that its, uh, that its foundations have gotten weaker, and it's time to restore our Islamic totality. Uh, in fact, there are two reasons why this is bogus, essentially. The first is, and I think Roya set this out really well last night, as with all fascistic and quasi-fascistic movements that hearken back to some pristine moment where, when things were orderly and there was a total, this you know, pristine and whole identity that has now you know, been eroded, there was never that Islamic totality. In other words, uh, if you go back to Iranian history, obviously Iran has its pre-Islamic heritage that dates back something like 25, uh, 500 BC, and then even before that of documented history. Um, and, and as you, some of you may know, that that identity actually persists in Iran despite the regime's attempts to uproot it and just focus on the post-Islamic history. In other words, Iranians love their pre, pre Islamic traditions, like celebrating Nowruz, the Persian New Year. Uh, uh, you know, there are any per Iranian that you'll meet, however uh, sort of minimal their knowledge of their own history, will tell you, you know, we had Cyrus the Great, and we had, uh, you know, Darius, and, and they, they had a rudimentary declaration of human rights back in 500 years ago. All this stuff refuses to go away. And it's there, and that's why this narrative of is the Islamic totality of the region is false. Um, also, Iran. I mean, Iran has never. It was. It was not preordained that Iran be the center of Shia Islam and Shia Islamism. In fact, Iran was part of the Sunni world, you know, up until the 15th and 16th century, and then became uh, a, 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 a predominantly Shia power. So, and that's another thing that that uh, that. Uh, makes that narrative a little problematic. Um, other bits, Iran has always had, you know, a, a minorities that were quite uh, vocal and and their you know in their identities, be it the the you know Jewish Persians, uh, there were you know Christianity made ro inroads uh, in the in in the country, and so it was this idea of this Islamic totality that never existed. I think is really. Uh, painful for the for the Iranian mullahs to to admit. Um, the second bit of why the Islamism isn't quite an authentic idea. It's not that Islam wasn't a part of Iran, or that it wasn't a traditionalist country. It's that Islamism, the idea of Islam as the centrally enforced principle of the state and of public life. That's a new invention. In fact, the people who proposed it, both inside Iran and in the Arab world, um, they were very much conversant with modernity. I mean, the, the idea of a total state is, is something that is in part in Euro European in origin, Western in origin. And uh, you know, guys like Ali Shariati, who was the, in some ways one of the intellectual architects of the Iranian Revolution, although he died in 1977 before the actual revolution um, you know, that he had preached for a very long time came to fruition, he he was he had studied uh, in in France and he was a big fan of you know Jean-Paul Sartre and and uh, and Marx and his theories were in some ways uh, mixing you know what he thought of as traditional Shia Islam with very modern theories about how the state should be organized, that, and then the, that those theories were of Western provenance. Um, uh, so, so, you know, he would preach about 
uh, how there's a need to root out dandyism and wine drinking. Well, uh, uh, you know, first of all, in the, in the West where he studied, I mean, he was exposed to uh, plenty of dandyism and wine drinking. And in, in Iran had uh, its own tradition of dandyism and wine drinking because uh, Persian poetry, if any of you have come across Rumi and uh, in the other great Persian poets, you, you'll notice it's full of these things. Uh, and so, uh, again, it, it, to me it makes it clear that both uh, in terms of their vision of what the past was like and their own claims to authenticity uh, the Islamists, certainly the Shia Islamists, have some, some things to account for, and there's some holes in their, in their theories. Which brings us to the second uh, idea that I think you as, as teachers have an opportunity to, opportunity to challenge. And this is the idea that Iran is the way it is, and Islamism exists because in reaction to things that happened in the 19th and 20th century. More specifically, it, it's all a reaction to colonialism or what happened in 1953 when um, Iran's Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh was overthrown. Um, I think this does an injustice to the Islamists themselves. I mean, in other words, it condescends to them because it says that their ideas aren't serious uh, and that they're not, uh, 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 you know, they don't have agency, they don't have control uh, over their own ideas. It's just, you know, we did certain things to them. The West, uh, you know, has, has uh, blood on its hand and, and, and historical sins to account for. And, uh, you know, the, these societies developed the way they did because of what we did. So, for example, in the movie Argo, which some of you may have seen, Roya mentioned there's a, there's a, a four-minute sequence at the beginning of the movie that tries to set the context and it's something, it goes something like this. And of course, I mean, I understand it's a movie, it's a character, you know, it has to, you know, set the con a historical context for the, for the 1979 hostage crisis, and it doesn't have a book, I mean, it doesn't have a book length opportunity to tell the story, but it goes something like this. Um, you know, Iran had a 2,500 year tradition of monarchy. The, the kings were called the shahs. The last shah was a cruel tyrant. There was a, a, a secular democrat who tried to nationalized Iran's oil uh, in 1953. He was forcefully overthrown. The Shah lived in opulence. The people starved. And here we are. They have a hostage crisis. Who can blame them? And in fact, at the beginning of the movie, when the, the news of the hostage crisis has first broken out, you see you know, a bunch of State Department officials you know, uh, uh, walking, uh, walking down a hall. And one of them says, well, we did it to them first. Remember 1953, which, by the way, I never think I, in, in, an American uh, uh, State Department official, whatever, uh, speaking that way, first of all. But, uh, you know, this idea that there's, there was some original sin on our part, and uh, now we're atoning for it by having to deal with Islamism. Again, not true. The ideas of Islamism uh, are, are serious ideas. They believe in what they're saying, and they, they're not just reacting to us, but they're putting forward a way of life. That way of life, in, in, in terms of how Ayatollah Khomeini saw it, was that uh, you know, back in the day, when uh, the local Ayatollah or the local mullah um, would, see, would come across orphan and, orphans or, or invalids, he would sort of take charge of them. He would take care of them, and he'd be responsible for them. The idea of Valayat al faqih which, which is the guardianship of the Juris Consult, which is the theory that uh, Ayatollah Khomeini put forward was this idea of the mullah or the cleric taking charge of the people because the, 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 you know, uh, they, they needed support. But it wasn't just invalids and, uh, and uh, orphans. It was an entire nation that needed pa you know, a, a patriarchal guide um, to rule over it. And his idea didn't just limit itself to Iran. It was the entire uh, Middle East that he sought to guide in, in the manner that a, 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 the old-time clerics would guide uh, the orphans and the invalids. It, this is a very serious idea, and it proposes itself as an alternative to liberal modernity. It poses itself as an alternative to American hegemony in the region, and it wants, to, it wants people to adopt this way of life. Now, it has it runs into some problems. First of all, that Iran, as you know, is Shia, whereas the rest of the region is Sunni. 
Iran is, is you know, a Persian power, although only 50% or so of the country is actually Persian ethnically, whereas the rest of the region is primarily Arab. But this is, this is the contest for the Middle East. It's between uh, you know, an ideology that's illiberal, it's, it's fundamentally undemocratic, and it's very serious about what it wants to do. And uh, you know, whatever alternative the US wants to put forth in the region, uh, so this idea that if we atone for something that, that happened in 1953, you know, Khomeini would say, oh, you know, uh, or his, or his uh, successor today, Ayatollah Khamenei, said, oh, yeah, the, thankfully, I mean, you know, Madeleine Albright said we shouldn't have overthrown him, uh, their um, prime minister in 1953. Okay, I'll, we'll, we'll make peace. You know, it, it's just is, is nonsense, and it's uh, it's unserious, and yet it's the it's the sort of narrative that's been uh, picked up, and uh, uh, you know, it filters down in Hollywood, and it you know, it's it's in popular books, all the Shah's men and others um, that put these ideas forward. That actually, it's quite condescending to the people of the region because it says they're not serious about their ideas; they're just reacting to what what we do to them. So these are two, two ways of thinking about uh, not just Iran, but I would say probably the entire Middle East that I think there's an, that you have an opportunity uh, to challenge and to, uh, to, or at least put forward the models and then ask as students to contemplate them and with, you know, with sufficient sort of skills and, and knowledge uh, sort of transmission on your part, I think there's an opportunity for students to come away with a more complex and rich view of, of, of Iran and the region than what they get from, uh, from our media and uh, our journalistic institutions and certainly from Hollywood. So let me stop there and open it up for, for discussion. In the back, way in the back. <laughs> uh, thank you for speaking with us today. Um, you said that uh, the people in charge uh, honestly believe uh, in what they are doing. Uh, and I've sort of wondered about that, if that's generally true, as opposed to uh, this is yet another example of men using an ideology, a belief system, uh, to seize and maintain power. That's not at all meant with any disrespect to those who actually do believe in what they're doing, but it seems to me that there really, at least is an element of that uh, among some percentage of those in charge. Thank you. No, I think that's right. I think uh, there are factions within the regime that have become totally cynical about this stuff. They've... they've uh, it's not like by becoming cynical about it, they've turned around and become good liberals by any means. But they've they sort of realize that this is a is a, a show that they have to maintain for for domestic and probably some foreign audiences as well, and so they maintain it. But I think uh, there are men within the regime who truly believe in some crazy messianic stuff. In other words, so for example, Ahmadinejad often talks about. Um, uh, uh, the twelfth Imam, this idea that the twelfth Imam of Shiite Islam, who has been in occultation, uh, you know, since his childhood, and it's been, you know, it's, it's a millennial state of occultation. God hid him because the time wasn't right for him, and the, the reigning Sunni caliph was gonna uh, uh, was out to get him. Uh, he he will return, and when he returns, he'll herald the apocalypse, um, and. There are members of the Iranian ruling class who believe we're near that, that end time period. Um, and they take it uh, very seriously. There's a guy named the Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi, who's Ahmadinejad's personal spiritual advisor, uh, who there is no way you can call this guy a cynical politician who's just saying this stuff in order to garner favor with the masses. I mean, He's, he's, a very, he's, a, he's a very learned guy. He's, he's written quite a bit about this stuff and, and uh, by all intents and purposes believes it. So I think there is an element within the regime uh, that 
has become cynical, that, 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 that you know, is keeping up the show. But I think it would be a mistake from a US policy perspective not to take seriously the ones who are, uh, are genuinely beholden to this stuff and the threat that they pose. Okay, we have a question uh, over here from Greg Hors, Taft School, Watertown, Connecticut. Thanks. Um, one of the interesting things that's come out of this is um, a strong reluctance on most of the speakers to tie the Operation Ajax to anti-Americanism or the hostage crisis. What was it then? Why did they focus on the American embassy as opposed to the British embassy when certainly Britain's conduct in Iran over the previous century would engender a lot of understandable resentment from the Iranians. Mm -hmm. Was it simply as a superpower? I know that there was a seizure of the, host of the American embassy or overrunning of the American embassy almost a year before the hostage crisis that was, I think, mostly Marxist. I can't remember off the top of my head. But if not Ajax, was it support of the Shah, uh, this anti-modernity movement within Islamism? Why, why take the embassy? Well, if you're, a, if you're Khomeini and you believe that you have a unique and global mission to restore the Islamic totality of the region, then you have to challenge the top dog in the region, which at that point was the United States. And I would argue it still is in some ways. The, you know, the most uh, you know, powerful force in the region that the rest of the region looks to. So if you're out to challenge that, you, the United States will undoubtedly be your number one uh, target. So and, and anti-Americanism is at the core of the regime's ideology has been since 1979 and has been in the years before that when the revolution was gestating. I'm not saying the, the US always behaved really well uh, in Iran. I think. Uh, so here's my theory of what generally happened in 1953. And I, I tend to follow, uh, I guess you call it a revisionist school, but it's a revisionist school that's increasingly uh, uh, made headways in terms of uh, 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 restructuring the narrative. Um, there's uh, Abbas Milani at, at Stanford uh, University and others uh, who've essentially put forth the idea that, yes, the US did uh, dole out money uh, in the lead up to the overthrow of Mossadegh in order to buy the allegiance of, of street thugs and newspaper editors and others and turn them against Mossadegh, but that at the same time, Mossadegh himself was losing his, uh, his uh, 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 the, the balance of social forces were sort of turning against him. The reason being that he had started to he wanted to bluff against the U.S. to tell the U.S., look, if, if you don't uh, come on our side in the oil dispute with Britain, we'll turn communist. So he had allied himself with the Tudeh Party, which was the Soviet-aligned Communist Party. And when they would have rallies, the National Front, which was Mossadegh's nationalist movement in favor of uh, nationalizing Iran's oil, would muster you know, a few thousand really disorganized forces on the streets. And then when the, when, the, uh, I'm sorry, when the Marxists would come out, uh, when the Tudé party would come out, there'd be 100,000 you know, uh, really well-organized cadres. And you know, people in the bazaar were looking at this. It wasn't just Americans who were worried about it. There were people in the bazaar. There were uh, some of the Islamist uh, leaders themselves at the time, like Ayatollah Kashani, who were disturbed by what they were seeing. And, you know, the, and then he also he was he was also acting really quite erratically. He would, you know, he gave himself plenary power, dissolved the Senate. He was acting quite quite autocratically for a guy that people say is a liberal secular Democrat who we overthrew. Um, so, uh, you know, did did we have some role in it? Yes. Would Mossadegh have stayed and Iran had become a liberal democracy, but for the fact that we intervened and, and doled out some money to? to random elements in Iranian society to turn, turn it against them? I don't think so. Um, so this original grievance that apologists for the regime and others use to say that you know, the Iran's domestic repression, the way it acts towards its neighbors, its rhetoric toward Israel, that all this stuff is justified because of this one incident 60 some years ago, I think is, is, is a mistake. 
that doesn't mean the U.S. was a perfect actor. Um, I did also on the cheat sheet we handed out earlier today, I gave you the two principal bibliographic references that take opposite positions on that issue of the 1953 coup. We'll go to Joseph Ferranti from uh, Smithtown, New York. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, what I was wondering is, is, do we find Islamicism somewhat befuddling because maybe we're looking at it the wrong way, rather than seeing it as just merely a reaction to the 1953 coup or just a reaction to modernity? What if we looked at it as we would maybe other fundamentalist movements, that it's part and parcel of the modern world, that the modern world is... Uh, forcing these religions or putting these religions in a situation where they have to deal with things like science and nationalism and new ways of orienting and, and uh, composing states. So would it make more sense, would it help us understand better if we saw this more as part of the modern world, as, as some aspect of the modern world, rather than something working against the modern world? I, I hope I made myself clear. I don't know if I... I think, you did. I think, I think it is a part and parcel of the modern world. Look, what used to happen in Muslim-majority societies, and certainly in, in Iran, was uh, the ruling class, which was the, you know, the, the secular rulers of the here and now, the shahs, uh, in the post-Islamic period, would essentially make a compact with the mullahs. They would, they, would, uh, they would rule as they do, as shahs do, and then the, uh, the mullahs would have, uh, would lend them a certain legitimacy, and they would also uh, have control over social matters. There was this push and pull between them. Sometimes one got the upper hand and the Shah was down, sometimes uh, the, other, the other way around. And then what happened, I mean, so, so you know, and, and Islam was the organizing principle for a lot of people's lives in, a, in you know, piety, it's, it's traditional societies. What's modern about Islamism is that it uses the apparatus of the modern state. You couldn't enforce a theocracy uh, in, back in you know, uh, the pre-modern era because you, the, the state wasn't organized in a way where you could monitor people's internet on the, uh, you know, activities on the internet or use, you know, as Khomeini did, he used tape recorders to disseminate his message in the years before the, uh, before the revolution. So, uh, yeah, exactly. I, think, I mean, it's, it's a modern phenomenon. There's, it, it couldn't exist were it not for the fact that, that we live in modern times. Likewise with Al-Qaeda, I mean, right? I mean, they, you, the, the, the seven, uh, not the seven, seven, but the, uh, the bombing in Spain that followed September 11, they used, you know, you know, cell phones to detonate the bombs that were on the trains. Well, that's, I mean, that's, it, 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 they're, they're, within, they're within modernity 100%. And I would, I would say that they wouldn't exist were it not for the fact that we're in modernity. Yeah. Question uh, from the right side, uh, John Calvert. From Creighton University. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I mean, just building on that very good question, I, I think, you know, the, it, Western discourses on Islam tend to essentialize the phenomenon, mm -hmm. tend to essentialize Islamism, you know, mm -hmm. treating it as a sui generis kind of phenomenon, something that's unique to the Middle East, when it's actually an aspect of global modernity. It has analogs in other times and other places. Um, I, I think that's what you were trying to, to get at in, in your question. And as educators, we have to think about a way of communicating this to, to students, that this isn't a phenomenon that sort of emerges from the Koran or from the Middle East. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, it's more sort of global in scope. Um, so, for example, um, when I discuss the Muslim Brotherhood with my students, I make comparisons with, uh, you know, how the Christian evangelical sort of movement mobilizes in this country, sort of a grassroots movement that wants to, you know, scrub the modern state clean of selfish individualism and political corruption through recourse to, to scripture, you know. Um, so I'm just wondering what your response to that is. I mean, as, as educators, we have to think about ways of communicating this sort of nativism, this sort of these reactionary movements. Yeah. And they're not unique to Islam. Right. Uh... Look, I agree. I agree with you that that that, in a broad sense, with the idea of of Islamism being uh, that it has analogs to other movements. But I, I utterly disagree with the the comparison to to evangelical Christians because evangelical Christians, uh, except for, I mean, the, 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 right, right, is there anti-abortion bombings 
but it's always in the, I mean, there's no coherent. The, the Muslim Brotherhood used to be uh, quite violent, and I would argue uh, it's still a, a totalitarian movement. Uh, and I think it's, 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 it's really uh, unfair uh, to compare them to evangelical Christians. Evangelical Christians, for the most part, operate within, within democracy. They're, they're people of faith, and they have certain views about how Western societies, or maybe all societies, should be organized. But they don't have, uh, there's no uh, armed wing of Pastor Hagee's uh, church, right? There's no, there's no like, uh, the, you know, the, whatever the equivalent would be. There's no Lashkar A. Pastor Hagee. Um, so I mean, I th- and so I think that there's a, that, that, mor- that that moral equivalence or the blurring of moral lines is a little bit risky um, to do because then you start uh, making judgments that, frankly, look a little bit uh, uh, repulsive because you know evangelicals are a different movement. Uh, it, now, did, was, was that was there at one point uh, extreme Christian movements? Uh, yes, of course, but I think that evangelicals have made their peace with, with liberal democracy. I don't think Islamist movements have. And I think the difference is very clear. Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm eager, I don't know if you have a follow-up, but I think... No, I, I, I like to join you could sure. rejoin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Ingrid Lutz from Carmel, New York. Hi, I was just wondering if you could say a word on Carter's handling of the hostage crisis. Did he handle it the best possible way, or in hindsight, was there some other route that he could possibly have followed? So, you know, I, I, I don't want to wear out my I welcome with a group of teachers, by, but you probably know I'm a, I'm a man of the, of the right, and I'm no fan of President Carter. Um, I think... I. I I have a piece about this in the current issue of commentary, uh, in the October issue of commentary, which in part touches on this. I think people are lo- wrong when they say um, President Obama lost Egypt, or they'll say President Carter lost Iran. Because you know, wh- the reason these revolutions happen are for you know, the larger historical reasons that we just described. And it's silly to say, I mean, there's no way that, that Carter could have uh, of, you know, uh, prevented the fall of the Shah, I think. Uh, in other words, by the time that he was in office, we so had, you know, the American intelligence community had so lost touch uh, of what was going on in Iran. And in fact, the best account of this uh, process is in David Chris's book in uh, The Twilight War, which I really recommend everyone read. Um, that there was no way that he could have, uh, there's no way that he could have stop the revolution. What I think Carter did wrong was in dealing with the aftermath um, by projecting weakness, uh, by not being uh, the, uh, the, you know, the voice and representative of, the, of the, the world's leading democracy. So for example, in how he treated the Shah, you know, right, the Khomeini and the Islamists wanted the Shah back. And Carter was, uh, you know, thinking he could have uh, relationships with Khomeini. Um, Carter administration officials described Khomeini, uh, and again, this goes to how much they, how little they knew about him. They described him as something like, of a saint that he'll be remembered like a Gandhi-like figure, uh, and they were willing to immediately ditch the Shah and go with Khomeini's forces. So when the Shah sought medical help here. It was, Carter was resisting it. And uh, uh, when he finally was allowed in at the behest of you know, members of Congress who thought you know, this guy was a US ally for, for some three decades, Kissinger intervened on the Shah's behalf. He forced the Shah to use sort of a side, side entrance to, to Mount Sinai just to keep him uh, off the cameras and to appease, essentially, the new regime that had, been, that had taken over. And you would think that that would, in some, that would uh, 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 maybe placate them, but in fact, the sign that it sent is that you can push the Americans around. So Carter dis- didn't lose Iran or didn't lose the revolution. What Carter did was lose the aftermath of the revolution by not uh, 
speaking uh, as firmly as he could about what had, had just transpired by, by muddling what was going on. Uh, and of course, the, 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 the statements of the Carter administration in the years leading up to the revolution are quite something to behold. I mean, they're, they're, uh, the absurdity of the things they said are, are pretty remarkable. So there's a friend of mine by the name of uh, uh, Lee Smith who wrote a book some of you may have read called The Strong Horse. Um, and uh, the, essentially the thesis of it is, comes from Osama bin Laden, a quote that's attributed to Osama bin Laden saying, uh, when people see a strong horse and they see a weak horse, they prefer the strong horse. They, they gravitate toward the strong horse. And the Carter's reaction to the revolution uh, essentially was an abdication of our strong horse role because it was, the rhetoric was uh, far too weak and, uh, and the, uh, uh, obviously the mil and then there was the military operation which was uh, quite bungled, the Eagle Claw operation. So that, that in short is my answer. Carter did a lot of wrong things. <laughs> Carol Bendall from Tro Troy, New York. Uh, thank you. Um, I, have, I guess a little to say and a question. Just, um, it's hard to argue with the idea that beating ourselves up over 1953 is unproductive. Um, but if we look at the post World War One mandate system, the you know, last years of traditional imperialism followed by a pattern of um, Cold War struggle, um, it does seem that U.S. and British behavior in the Middle East. Um, was troublesome and problematic. Um, nevertheless, your suggestion that um, to treat Islamism as primarily um, reactive, that it's reductive to those people and not productive, I think is really interesting. Um, so my question is, what would you suggest are the implications of your, of your position? How should we go forward in terms of communication? I think we should still set a vision for a in the long term, a liberal and democratic region emerging where right now stands uh, what Freedom House says is the least free region in the world. In other words, our goal should be, and, we, and that in part, by doing that, we would be uh, uh, accounting for uh, whatever imperial sins real and imagined far better than by going about apologizing for, for 1953. Now, what that means is we have to confront Islamism as it is. We should respond to it uh, vigorously. Uh, I like drones, uh, <laughs> but, but also, I mean, uh, but also, I mean, so that, that's how, you know, how you deal with the really extremist Al Qaeda types. But with the rest of the region, we should be uh, playing this the way we did in the aftermath of World War II, when you had a, a, a region that was devastated by. Uh, gruesome ideologies. It was emerging terrible economies, things out of shape, and we went in and essentially we decided to shape outcomes. We favored certain actors and we disfavored other actors. Um, was where we always uh, morally straight, in other words, were we always uh, promoting liberals and Democrats? No, but in the broad, broad sense, we sought as our, our, our goal especially with, with the uh, presidency of Ronald Reagan, the idea that a, a democracy can, can come into shape in this area. I think we should continue to do that. So, uh, but that means realizing that we're in an ideological conflict. We have certain allies, the liberals and Democrats in the region, who aren't perfect. Sometimes, sometimes they're almost as, as anti-American as the Islamists, either for genuine ideological reasons or because they feel... Uh, uh, in order to be credible on the street, they have to be anti-American as well. But regardless, they're the best allies that we have, the women in the region, the minorities, the liberal forces. And, and, and it, I think it's a mistake not to realize that there is an other side to that, which are the Islamists, who their vision is anti-Western. Um, they might uh, you know, act democratically, uh, but they're illiberal. Uh, and when the rule is threatened, our experience shows that when the rule is threatened, then they ditch the democratic part of their mandate. Um, this is going to the Muslim Brotherhood more, not Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda rejects 
democracy, but the sort of the what people call moderate Islamists. I think they're they're not uh, they're not Democrats. So um, I think we should we should essentially bolster our allies and weaken our enemies. Okay. Next, uh, we'll turn to Lawrence Yusuf. There have been some who have suggested that an appropriate course of action for the United States would be one of containment of Islamism and perhaps a fanning of the flames of the Sunni Shia schism in order to bring about either a conflagration or a reformation in Islam writ large. Reactions? Well, uh, I mean, I think when people say that, especially right now, Syria is on, on everyone's mind, right? Uh, in Syria, you have uh, a minority regime, an Alawite regime, that is allied with Iran. And whatever the, the origins of the uprising in Syria, it's now become primarily a, a sectarian war. The Turkey and the, and the Sunni Arab powers have their dog in the fight, and Iran has its dog in the fight. Um, that's not, uh, that's not a, 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 a part of a, a pro-democracy vision to fan those flames. But before any of that, I think we have to try to secure our national interests. And we have a national security interest in the Assad regime falling. Uh, whatever would come after it in terms of uh, Sunni Islamists, they're terrible, but they're not as bad as, uh, as the Assad regime. First of all, the brutality of the Assad regime with 30,000 dead uh, speaks for itself. And second of all, the Assad regime is Iran's uh, link to the Mediterranean. Uh, so uh, in the idea that we uh, fan sectarian flames doesn't sound like uh, responsible stewardship of the region. But that doesn't mean that uh, we can't pick certain actors over others when uh, the actors that are in play are both bad, but one of, one of them is worse. And I think the, the worst one right now is certainly the, the, the Tehran access that sort of links Tehran, Damascus, and then Hezbollah and uh, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. I, you know, I see those as one uh, access, and I think it, they're the ones that are worth confronting that pose the greatest threat to our interests in the region. Okay, on the right side, uh, Timothy Connell from Ohio. Thank you. you, you you've talked about uh, it seems to me a dichotomy where Islamism is on one side and modernity is on the other. And is it necessary to have an autocrat such as the Shah imposing modernity essentially and placating the Muslims, or you have an Islamist regime that is intolerant of modernity? Can you present a scenario where there, there's some melding where you uh, essentially can have a liberal democracy with a thriving Islam or, or not? Well, first of all, going back to my initial remarks, I don't think Islamism is opposed to modernity per se. It's opposed to liberal modernity. Um, it, it takes advantage of, of uh, uh, ideologies and ways of organizing the state that are actually, as I said, are quite modern. You couldn't, you couldn't have uh, societies organized the way Islamist theocracies are uh, back in the 7th century. Um, but in right. terms of how, uh, you know, that, that long-term vision, can we meld? I don't, first of all, I don't think the autocrats are, are lasting. So in other words, I don't think that the Shah uh, or Ataturk or that model of imp imposing liberalism top-down works. Um, on the other hand, I think that as we learned with uh, the experience of communism, and fascism. If an ideology keeps telling you it's anti-Western and it's illiberal, it's silly to say, but over time, they'll moderate. Uh, you know, so for example, um, Hamas. Right? Everyone said, Hamas, once it comes into power and it governs, it has to deal with the responsibilities of governance, and it'll soften, and it'll, you know, it'll, it'll become a regular uh, an average state actor. In fact, it hasn't. It, uh, you know, people said, oh, the, it'll have to run sewers and, and, and uh, and uh, water departments and electricity departments, so that, you know, it'll, it, that'll, that'll help. Well, it, the sewers don't run. Gaza is a mess. And they've still remained uh, 
a, uh, a totalitarian force. So in the long term, though, I think there is something to what you said in the sense that the people of faith in the region, and this goes in part to the theologians and the, the, and the, and the clerics, uh, have to make peace with, with liberalism for this, to, for this mo region to move forward. And, and so therefore, uh, and I can't provide those answers. In other words, I'm, I'm not conversant with uh, the text to the extent necessary to be able to uh, reform them internally. And I don't think uh, anybody who uh, 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 isn't conversant with them should set forth on, on trying to reform Islam. That has to come from within, and that's a, that's a long-term process. But in the meanwhile, I think it's a mistake to think of, of Islamists who keep saying this is what we believe, uh, to keep hoping that, oh, but they'll change, they'll have to govern, they'll have to run elections, they'll have to run electricity and, and water and tourism departments, and that'll, that'll uh, uh, force a change within them. Uh, so, Rob, what uh, future do you see for the Green Movement in Iran? I think the Green, green Movement is defunct. I mean, uh, I think there will be a, a, a next uprising, um, because the, the regime is... Uh, as the, as the Marxists used to say, has too many internal contradictions. It has you know, the young population, which as you know, 70% you know, or 60% of Iran is under 30. Um, it, it, it does have, Iran does have a, a constitutional tradition going back to the, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and it has a, as a relatively educated population. You can't run a theocracy on that basis. Now, the specific green movement that emerged in 2009, I think it's, it's defunct. By, I mean, I, I haven't seen science to suggest to me that it's, uh, it's alive and well. Um, so, uh, but it, so it, in other words, the next time there'll be an explosion, it'll be under a different banner. It won't be Musavi, Karubi, and that crowd of, of, the, of the greens. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? If not, we'll take a break and be back in 15 minutes. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you.